This is Right From The Deep. I'm Karen Ball. And I'm Erin Taylor Young. And this is the podcast from writers for writers, answering the question, why am I doing this? Right. As writers, editors, and a former literary agent, we're in the deep with you, encouraging you and equipping you to find your truest story in the deep places. Get our show notes and more, including a free audio download on how to safeguard your writer's heart at writefromthedeep.com. Hey guys, here's what's happening at Right From The Deep. First, as always, thanks to our wonderful patrons on Patreon who help make this show possible. Yes. We appreciate your willingness to support the show by helping to pay for hosting and our time. It really takes quite a bit of both to do this podcast. To see how you can help support the show, go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Right From The Deep. Yes, and thank you also to our February sponsor of the month, Bobby Updegrav. Yay, Bobby! <laughs> we are so happy for um, her sponsorship for this month. And you guys could find out more about another important cause that she sponsors at friendsofrenacer.com. That's F R I E N D S O F R E N A C E R.com. This is a really cool ministry. If you go to their website, you can read about it, but it's cool. It's a ministry for orphan children in Honduras. And we're thankful too for our sponsorship from the Novel Marketing Podcast with host Thomas Umstead Jr. He's a great guy and he's a smart guy. His podcast is the longest running book marketing podcast in the world. We know and trust <laughs> Thomas and his podcast is full of really great information and advice like Novel Marketing's 10 Commandments of Book Marketing, which we've been bringing you. Indeed. And this week we're talking about commandment number nine, thou shalt not publish thy first book first. This is actually a controversial commandment, but think about how an athlete um, does their training. Uh, I guess what, February, right? The Olympics are going on or have started at least. Your first race is never going to be in the Olympics for a gold medal, right? You have a lot to learn before you can get to that level. And that's how it works with writing. Your first book is not going to be gold medal quality. It's going to be training quality. You know, writers too often feel that any word they write is wasted if they don't get published, but you can't get better at writing with without writing. Yeah. That means a lot of words are going to be practice, and that's okay. Right, and we're not saying that that first book can never be published, but generally, it better to publish it later after you're better, because usually you go back to it and you're like, oh yeah, I needed a lot of help. But too many writers get overly focused on that first book, and they become discouraged when it doesn't get published, or they maybe publish it themselves because they think it's ready, and it's not. So, don't publish your first book first. <laughs> For more book promotion and platform help, listen to Novel Marketing in your favorite podcast app or at novelmarketing.com. We've also been sharing wonders with you, and it's my time to share. I had something not so wonderful happen um, earlier this week. Well, no, earlier last week, I ended up with food poisoning. Oh, my fun. husband is visiting his family in Illinois, so I was by myself with the dogs. After about five and a half hours of dealing with the, the side effects of food poisoning, I called an ambulance. And they picked me up. They got me into the ambulance. And I, I tell you guys, I've never had food poisoning before. It is freaking painful. Mm. I mean, I was doubled over in pain. And having just trying to stop the pain, I put my hands over my abdomen and just praying in tongues just came out of me. I did it out loud. I wasn't embarrassed about it. I just started praying. And just like that, the pain went away. I should not be amazed when things like that happen, but it did. It it just filled me with so much wonder. Now, admittedly, when I got to the ER, um, it still hurt some, but then it started easing up so that by the time after a three and a half hour wait to get back to the ER, Ouch. by the time I went back there, it wasn't nearly so painful. So I just am amazed at the way that God comes and helps us when we need him and and how Often we forget what powerful thing prayer is. Yeah, amen. And now, here's, here's the, the show. show. 
Welcome, listeners. We're glad that you're here with us in the deep. You know, it's still pretty early in the year, and this year we want to encourage you to make the year one where you deliberately seek a better and more accurate picture of who God is. I've been reading very slowly a book called Knowledge of the Holy, and it's a book by A.W. Tozer, and I just love what he has to say. I think it's so wise. He says that he thinks that the church has a problem. It's the, and I'll quote here, loss of the concept of majesty from the popular religious mind. The church has surrendered her once lofty concept of God and has substituted for it one so low, so ignoble as to be utterly unworthy of thinking, worshiping people. Ouch, right? He goes on to say, This she has not done deliberately, but little by little, and without her knowledge and her very unawareness, only makes her situation all the more tragic. You know, we can't be still and know that God is God if we have a wrong concept of who God is. Uh, We wanted to share some attributes of God and why they matter to us as individuals and as writers. Right. So Karen and I were having fun with this. We've been just thinking of different attributes and pondering over the course of the last couple of weeks. And so we're just going to kind of go for it. So the first one I thought of is that God is transcendent. And (laughs) I realize that's a fancy word. I've always kind of wondered what it meant. But for me, the idea of God being transcendent, I like to define that as totally other. It's like, like our human thought, we we can't truly comprehend or imagine who God is or what or what he's like. How is he like? He's not us. He's so totally different from us in in his substance, you know. And and so for me, it's like we can't minimize him. We can't make him like us. I think we have a tendency to try to. Uh, anthropomorphize God too much, make him too human, but he's not. He's beyond. And for me, then I start thinking about how crossing the gulf of who God is to who we are is completely unattainable, except that God crossed that gulf for us. He reached out to us. It's because of who he is that we can even relate to him. And then I start thinking about what does that mean for a writer? And for me, it it brings up awe. It brings up reverence. It brings a sense of humility that this God would reach to to us. And it brings a sense of gratitude. And uh, I don't want to forget how dependent I am that he reaches out to us, that he draws us to him. And, and I want to keep acknowledging my need for him to keep doing it. There, I can't claw my way to him. It's him who reaches out to me and to us. God is also the Alpha and the Omega, and I, I love this. I love this for a number of reasons. Revelation 1.8, I'm sure you all have heard it before. I am the Alpha and the Omega, mm. the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. And the reason that I like this so much is that when, when we consider God being the Alpha and the Omega, not just of the world, but bring it down in a macro sense and and think about it in our own lives. He is the God of our beginning, the God of our end, and the God of everything in between. We never have to feel as though, and if we have those feelings, they're, they're false, they're from the enemy. We never have to feel as though God was with us when we were born and growing up and, and suddenly he's not there anymore. Or in the beginning of our career and things went one way and then suddenly it changes and we're wondering where God is. Guys, it's there for the beginning the end and everything in between. He is our Alpha and Omega for us as individuals and as writers. I love that. I love those words. There's another verse that I like. It's Isaiah 44, 6, and it says, this is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. What I like about that, first and last, it, it it's just 
constantly giving us a sense of who God is. He's the only first and last. There is no other first and last. And I think about when Karen and I were thinking about the attributes, we were fun. And it was fun to think about how similar some of our attributes were. And I thought of that God is pre-existence, which, which reminds me of the Alpha and the Omega. It's He has no beginning and he has no end. And I, my little brain struggles with that. He has no beginning. He just always was. And that's what it means to be God, to be always, you know, who was, who is, and who always will be, you know, that's who God is. And that tells me that, you know, we are the ones, people, we're the ones with the beginning. We're the created things. God's timeless. He's outside of time. Like he made time. He's been there, done that. He purposed us into existence. And to me also, one of my favorite verses is Hebrews 1, 3, where um, we, we learn that Jesus is like sustaining all things by his powerful word. So he's holding everything up. He started it all. It starts with him. It ends with him. So for me, for writers, I think about God's integrity. It's his moral code that matters because he started it all. He started us. He created us. And so he has that right. He can set the rules. And it's our job to submit to that because he's the beginning. <laughs> I also like the idea, the attribute of God, that he's the Rose of Sharon. That's from one verse in Song of Songs when the bride is telling her husband that she's the Rose of Sharon and the Lilies of the Valley. And it sounds like she's boasting, but she's really not. She's simply telling him, this is who I am. This is the beauty of who I am with you and the beauty of our love. I have two Rose of Sharon. Uh, bushes in my yard. I absolutely love them. Um, when the buds come on, they're really kind of nondescript, but then the flowers start to open. First, you see this little bit of deep um, burgundy coming up out of the green, and then it starts to open up. Just It opens in stages, and with each stage, there's something more intricate and more beautiful to see from the, the coloring of the flowers to the stamen. It's just, it's amazing, and there are so many of them. They're abundant, mm -hmm. so it reminds me that with God, he is beauty, and he wants to reveal himself to us, but he does it in stages so that we can take it in. If it was all at once, it would blow our minds, and we'd just yes. be sitting there babbling. <laughs> but he, he lets us see him and meet him and see the beauty in who he is and all the different facets. He does that in his timing in the way that's best for us so that we can absorb it. And that's the way that we communicate with our readers in our books. We unfold the truths that God has given us in the words that we get on the page. And we don't mm. try to beat them over the head with it because that's preaching. That's not good writing. But if we share with them the reality and the beauty of who God is and the many facets of who he is, we do that with an understanding that they can only take in so much and God will take those words that we put on the page and show himself to our readers. You know what I was thinking about too, Karen, when you were talking about the buds being nondescript, you know, that's how our writing looks at the right. beginning too. <laughs> I mean, I just, I'm thinking what a perfect metaphor too for writing a book or anything, you know, a blog post, whatever you write, it just starts in this sort of nondescript way. And slowly through the process of creation, it becomes a thing of beauty. Right. And my, one of my favorite things about the Rose of Sharon is that I see little hummingbirds. Oh, that, all the time. Well, I, yeah. And so, like, these birds feed on this beauty. And so yeah. I just, I love that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so next, um, God is omniscient. Um, mm. And sometimes I think about, you know, we can be flippant about that. Well, okay, he knows everything. But it's not just that. It's that his focused attention is on every single thing all the time, every second, every single second. Like my son is studying physics, and I think about the little things at these 
um, the, the quantum level. It's like this tiny little like system. And it's just like God is still focused on atoms and electrons and two trillion galaxies out there. You know, God is doing that. And so for writers, I think it's easy sometimes for us to think that God is not paying attention. Well, he he has to. That's who he is. He right. is always paying attention. Not just you're there, but like focused attention, probably the kind of focus we all strive for. And I was telling Karen, it's hard for me to focus sometimes. God doesn't have a problem with focus. And his focused attention is on you and your situation as a writer and on every word you put on the paper and on every issue that you deal with. Nothing is too big or too small for God to be paying attention to because it's there all the time. For me, I wish I remembered that. I wish my attention was as focused on him 24-7 as his is on me. Um, that's something that I want to work on this year. For for the new year, I think that's my word, Karen. Focus. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Well, you know, you know what I love about that is is God being omniscient. He's also our advocate. Mm -hmm. I, I watch a lot of legal um, procedurals, um, police procedurals. Uh, one of my favorite shows of all time, and I watch it over and over and over, is <laughs> the original Law and Order. I just love that show, and I love how smart. The attorneys are the advocates and how they have to know every little facet of what's going on in order to do the things that they do. Well, God is all knowing. Like you said, he's omniscient. He knows not just how to speak on our behalf, but he knows what's going on inside of us. He acts on our behalf, not just for us, but in us. He works inside of us, giving us the desire and the power to do what pleases him. But remember, because he's all knowing, he knows everything about us. And he does the work of refining us because of that deep core deep knowledge. He supports us. He defends us. He intercedes for us. He, he does all of this because he knows us and nothing in what he knows about us is discouraging or disappointing or frustrating for him. He understands because he created us and he knows how to lead us into what he wants us to be in, in anything that we do, whether it's writing or as a parent or as an individual, his knowledge of us is complete and we never have to be afraid to go to him and say, I'm struggling with this because our God who knows us will intercede for us and he will speak for us and he will he will do the refining work inside of us. I love the notion of advocate because, I mean, we have an accuser, right? We, right. we, oh my we constantly, you know, are buffeted by what Satan wants to do to us. But we, who shall bring any charge against God's elect, right? right? Why? Why is Paul saying that in Romans 8? He's saying that because God, God is the one who justifies us. God is the judge. God is our advocate. God, God is God. There's no one else that can, can step in and do or take away or take us out of his hand. That is my favorite thing. Um, here, listen to this, guys. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Can anything ever separate us from the love of Christ? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or cold or in danger or threatened with death? Even the scriptures say, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord our advocate. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And that that brings us to another attribute. God is all powerful. He's omnipotent. I don't know how 
often we spend just dwelling on that, that like all the power there could be in existence, he he has, that. that's who he is. And I don't know what the most powerful thing is that you've ever seen, but I, I once, when we lived in Oklahoma, you know, they, they put storms, you know, there's tornadoes down there quite a bit. And you can see like the storm chasers will go out there and you can see tornadoes like on TV forming. And I once saw a small tornado turn into a mile wide F5 tornado mm -hmm. that just gouged a hole in the ground um, for miles. And it was the most one of them, probably maybe the most frightening thing I've ever seen, um, just that power. But God is more powerful. <laughs> God can do anything. When I think about that as a writer, you know, he can do anything. You guys, what is your impossible situation right now that you think is impossible that you're facing? God, God did the virgin birth. He opened the eyes of a man born blind. He can get you a contract or cancel your contract. He can sell books or not sell books. What is your impossible situation? He knows it. And he's already got it covered. He's taking care of it. He, his best work in us always, um, the all-powerful God, in my opinion, is always the transition of making us into more like Christ. And that's what's happening in your lives too. That's why he's more powerful. That's what he does. One of my favorite verses is, um, Jesus saying, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. And I think that work is him not only holding the universe and sustaining all things by his powerful word, but continuing to conform you to Christ every day, every moment. Hmm. And in conforming us to Christ, we start to see him more clearly and with a better understanding of who he is. Um, I love it that he's called both the Lion of Judah and the Lamb. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Think about that. That's, again, that that um, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Lions, I, I love the big cats. Whenever I go to the zoo, I, I go to see the big cats. And lions are just so powerful and strong and fierce and regal. And whenever I see them, they put me in mind of God because they're just so majestic. But one day I went to a zoo and they had this huge viewing area with, you know, the, the really thick glass and everything. And the lions could come right up to the glass. And there was a little girl who was kneeling on the sill of that viewing area. And all of a sudden the male lion who had just been, you know, sitting there and looking stunning, he turns his head and he fixed his gaze on that child. And he just kind of flowed up onto his feet and bam, he came at that, that window. <sighs> he went paws on there. He, I mean, this girl was like teeny tiny on the other side of the glass and this enormous, powerful beast that had just per burst forward. Everybody in that viewing area was like, whoa, <laughs> backed up really fast. We had this inbuilt sense of awe and fear at that kind of power and and that kind of energy that comes. And it was clear, this is the king of the jungle <laughs> right here. Of course, a little two-year-old was was not even aware of what was going on, but her parents grabbed her up and ran her <laughs> there. So I think of God with that kind of power, that fierceness, that majesty. And yet at the same time, he's the lamb. And, mm. and that puts us in mind of innocence and sacrifice and purity. God is everything to us. He is everything. He is the power and the protector and all of those things. And yet at the same time, through Jesus, he's the epitome of innocence, of sacrifice and purity, of sacrificial love. It's just amazing to me what seem to be contrasts in Jesus and in Christ and in God. They're not contrasts at all. They're just the many facets of who he is. I love that because had he not been the lamb he would not have gone to the cross. Right. I mean, can you imagine what it took to stay there on the cross when he could have just blinked it all out of existence? Right. And yet 
yet he didn't. And yet then the lion comes back with the resurrection. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and there's something else happened at a different zoo. I visit zoos a lot when I travel, especially. <laughs> I was I was on the opposite side of the zoo from where the lion enclosure was. And all of a sudden this roar, it just echoed all around. And this time, instead of people backing off, everybody, myself included, we ran to get to the lion enclosure to see what was going on. And the closer we got, the louder it was. I felt that roar in my chest. Mm. And they were at feeding time. Wow. And the lions were like, get that food in here. I'm hungry. But that the roar, we have this instinctive, again, fear of that kind of unhindered power. Mm. And fascination. We're drawn to it and we're repelled by it. So when the Bible tells us that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, he he's not a God. He's not a God. He's not a lion who's going to come up and just kind of rub his little head against us and we get to pet him. God is powerful, the kind of power we can't even understand. Yeah. Another thing that God is, is God is the amen if you know what amen means, it's like, may it be so, or let it be so. He's the ultimate, let it be so, the final word. It's used 54 times. Amen is used 54 times in the Bible to show agreement, to acknowledge God's word and truth, to align with God and Jesus. I did a little bit of research and, um, Amen, the word itself is what's called a transliteration because the word is pronounced pretty much the same way it was in the original language. And it's just given one or two letters that make it make sense in a new language. So the word amen is one of the few words in existence that's pronounced almost exactly the same way in every language. When we say amen, then We are saying the same exact word that has been uttered as a confirmation of belief for thousands of years. We're speaking the same word spoken by the priests and the prophets and Jesus himself. Hmm. God is the amen to everything. God is the let it be so. Amen. It is finished. In Revelation 22, 20 through 21, we read this. He who testifies to these things says, yes. I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. So I encourage you this year. Amen. Amen (laughs) that we align ourselves with God. Amen to align ourselves with Christ. And amen to digging in and knowing who God is in all the facets. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. You can find previous episodes and more resources at writefromthedeep.com. And I bet you know someone who needs this podcast, so please share it with them. So until next time, embrace the deep. Your writing and your life will never be the same. Mm-hmm.